Entrepreneurial spirit. So what is it? Let's, uh, and there's a million definitions. I'm just going to give you mine, just my quick three. Um, it's about passion, loving what you do. Uh, it's about working with people that you love and respect, uh, smart people. And you're all gathered together uh, to make insanely great products or deliver incredible services. This is a lineup for, um, for Apple products, you know, be it Apple iPhones. I believe this is an iPhone release there. Um, so, you know, so that's my um, passion and my love for entrepreneurship in a nutshell. Um, we just had an election a couple days ago uh, in the U.S., and I wanted to just uh, just talk about culture a little bit, give you a little bit of comparison between the U.S. and Canada. So um, Mitt Romney lost, and by the way, it feels like you know this is kind of like a Mitt Romney type room, you know, all these suits, and we're in a dark room. Let's talk about poor people. No, um, <laughs> so. This is Donald Trump. Um, man, what a sore loser this guy is, huh? Uh, so, you know, so his guy loses, and all of a sudden we're talking about a revolution. Oh my God. Does this guy not realize that in revolutions, poor people, or, or poor people win and uh, rich people lose? I don't know. Maybe he's not quite that smart. Um, but I guess we kind of knew that. Um, the Canadian thing, you know, I, I'd, you know, you gotta love Canadians. Um, as much criticism as we have sometimes for, you know, for our Canadian politicians, um, you know, every time we see what happens in the U.S., um, you just got to love the country that we live in. So, and we all have seen this. This is uh, Jack Layton's final letter to us, um, and his words were, "My friends, love is better than anger. Hope is better than fear. Optimism is better than despair. So let us be loving, hopeful, and optimistic." and we'll change the world. So think about that and think about how uh, the things that we're doing can actually change the world. Um, and so we talked about some of the economic indicators, um, some of the cultural indicators of why Canada and Alberta in particular um, is in a leadership position. And we only want to get better. Um, this is from uh, Future Brand, and it shows that Canada was running uh, number one as far as brand amongst countries go for the previous two years, and for uh, for 2012 and 2013 we were beat out, uh, beat out by the Swiss, the damn Swiss. Um, and uh, here are some of the numbers. Uh, we're number two for job opportunities, number four in the categories of healthcare and standard of living, number five for investment climate and political freedom, and number six for environmental friendliness and freedom of speech, number seven for education. So we have some things to work on, but we're number two in the world when it comes to brand, ahead of, way ahead of, our neighbors to the south, the United States, um, in, uh, in eighth spot. So. So I think we have a lot to be proud of as Canadians and Albertans. And I want to give you my little piece of, uh, of my Canadian background. Um, I didn't start out as a Canadian. I was born in um, 1967 in Hong Kong. There's mom and dad, and uh, there's, I was this fat little bald guy. So, um, and I have a complex around that, so therefore I've grown lots of hair. Um, in 1972, when I was uh, five, we uh, immigrated to Canada. And for those of you who uh, are of Asian descent or know any Asians, you'll know that um, the parents do this because of educational opportunities. So what we saw in Hong Kong was, uh, was a system where, um, where only the best got through to post-secondary education. And my parents wanted something better uh, for their kids. So my, uh, my mom, dad, uh, me at age of five, my sister at the age of two, uh, immigrated to Canada. Um, and it, it wasn't like it was easy for my parents. Uh, they, they struggled with the language and they continue to struggle with the language today. They came as skilled, uh, educated uh, people, but could never work in a skilled, educated profession because of that. There is uh, a photo of uh, my dad's uh, 
awesome Nova, 1974 Nova. And uh, there's everything loaded, every single one of our possessions loaded into the Nova. And you notice how low the back wheel is. And some mattresses and bed frames on top. And there we are driving to Ontario on a, on a trek to find, uh, find new business and, and a new home. We never ended up sticking in Ontario. Um, thankfully, uh, we m ended up making it all the way back to, um, to Alberta, where, like all good Chinese people, my dad uh, bought a uh, grocery store. And uh, there we are. With, uh, there's my sister and my uncle. Um, and, uh, and what's fascinating to me is that entrepreneurship just exists at every level. Um, one of the things my dad did uh, was to was to do a lot of competitive analysis way before competitive analysis was in vogue. So he would take me to all these grocery stores, and we'd sit outside of grocery stores and restaurants, and we just would count people going in and out. And so he'd just understand traffic flow and what people were buying, how big the bags were they were carrying out, and just doing an estimate on on how much they were making. And this was you know 30, 40 years ago. It was it was amazing the kind of stuff that my dad did. Um, and 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 so I didn't even know I was being taught entrepreneurship, um, but at the time um, that's uh, that's what was happening. And of course my dad. Um, my dad would be one of these Asian parents to say, you know, do not ever do what I'm doing. Just do what I say. And what I say is, go to school, get a great education, and because this is all for you. I sacrificed my career for you. So there was a lot of guilt in being a Chinese kid. Um, this, I just throw this in there to show that my hair has always been pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm looking like a young Bruce Lee there. Um, this, this was not so great of a hair day. That was high school grad um, and uh, Bishop Carroll High School, by the way. Um, so when I graduated high school, first thing I did was I went out and bought, a, bought an Apple Macintosh. This, this thing was an amazing machine. You know, in 1984, this thing was about four and a half grand, did not have a hard drive. Uh, Nine-inch uh, mono monochrome screen, and uh, it was amazing. This thing changed my life, um, uh, and because I think that had I relied on my education, uh, it probably just wasn't enough. Um, so, so all that guilt that my parents laid on me for for you know. The, for wanting me to be an engineer, a doctor, or a lawyer, or whatever, didn't happen. I, um, I went and I burned their entire hopes and dreams down to ashes because uh, I took five years and I uh, completed a sociology degree. Um, the shame of all Asians, liberal arts degree. I, you know, I still get um, calls from my mom saying, you know, so-and-so's daughter is a research scientist at McGill. Um, yeah, mom, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, it's so great. She's so smart. Um, so, yeah. So, anyways, um, mom. Uh, so I went. I went from there, and because of partially because of education, but mostly because I learned how to use a computer, I was able to get a job uh, eventually at a company called Adobe Systems, and uh, that was a great kind of four or five years of my life. Uh, learned a ton not only about the graphic arts industry, um, but about business in general. And on top of that, um, I had the opportunity to go to um, go back to school after a few years of working. So uh, in 1999, I went back and did the executive MBA program at, uh, at the University of Calgary. So one of the things that MBA uh, school does is um, it makes, it doesn't necessarily make you smart, but it makes you think you're smart. So, um, and anybody who's met an MBA knows that. Um, it's a, Matt, that guy thinks he's smart. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Any MBAs out there? I love insulting MBAs. Um, so, after MBA school, I was just full of piss and vinegar, and I wanted to do something amazing. I, I thought I could be smarter than most of the corporations out there. So I didn't look for a corporate job. Um, I ended up running into an old partner of mine, uh, Bruce Livingston. I worked with him at Adobe. He 
he created a little website. Uh, you know, it was a, kind of the thing of the day was to uh, was to create websites back in you know Y two K. And uh, he had this little website, which was essentially just giving out free photos. And after working at, a, at Adobe for five years, where we sold photos for hundreds of dollars each, I thought, man, what a great idea. You know, this, this thing really has the potential to disrupt the industry. Um, and the industry was big. You know, we sold, the industry sold images, millions of dollars of images. And iStock Photo essentially gave away images because it was community-based. You know, we, we made photographers feel passionate about their photography so that, you know, so that they, they valued passion more than they valued the money. Um, and after a few years of running it, Getty Images, one of the biggest players in the industry, ended up buying iStock Photo for $50 million. And at the age of 38 or so, um, I was without a job because I just didn't feel like working for this big old multi-million dollar corporation. Um, took a few years off and um, just uh, needed to find work again. So I joined Fotolia. Um, and Fotolia has been an absolutely fantastic ride. When I joined, uh, we had a valuation of 100 mil and uh, activity has just picked up again. So just as a sign that the economy is getting healthy all over again, um, we took a $500 million valuation uh, and took some financing just this summer. Um, so, uh, if you were to ask me, uh, you know, how do you build great entrepreneurs? Uh, my answer is, well, just a lot of good luck and a little bit of hard work and you know, just a group of friends that really watch out for you. And, you know, after we sold iStock Photo, um, I suddenly had this, this large so social circle where schools and uh, businesses and, and community associations were asking me to get up in front of their people, their community, and tell my story. Um, so I did a lot of this kind of stuff and talk about, um, talk about my entrepreneurial story. And there it is. Um, but I've learned a few things along the way and I just want to share a few of them with you. Um, the first thing is, is to understand the numbers. Um, everybody's seen this, and, but they've never had it applied to them in their world. This is obviously a standard distribution curve, and it explains the way that the world works. Um, when I go into a classroom, uh, when I go into any classroom, be it a high school classroom, be it a university classroom at the bachelor's level or at the master's level, and I ask the students, um, how many of you think you're exceptional? And I won't ask you to do it here, but just imaginary show of hands. How many of you think you're exceptional above average people? And, um, and there's just no doubt that 95% of them put up their hands, okay? Um, and that's not possible. The standard distribution curve says it's not possible that any kind of average crowd can be 95% exceptional. The curve says that 68.2% of the people are just you know, slightly above average or slightly below average. Okay? Um, so you know, let me restate that. Okay? If you just add everything, one standard deviation and above to the right-hand side of the chart, that's 15.8% of the people in the world okay, that, are, that are above average. Okay. And some are way above average, 0.1% are way above average, 2.1% are kind of above average, 13.6% are, you know, are one standard deviation above average. So I think you get the idea that, you know, that being average is kind of like you know, what the population does. So my lesson in this is that mediocrity abounds. Okay. It's just the law of averages. And what are we willing to do to rise above that mediocrity? Okay. And I think this is a motivating point. Okay. So the second question to how many of you think you're exceptional is how many of you have gone and done something exceptional? Okay. Do you expect to produce exceptional results from average efforts? Okay. Think about that for a moment. Okay. 
When you talk to people, and this can be young people, old people, does not matter, okay? They expect to be exceptional, but they only put in average efforts, okay? Um, and I think it's important to understand and to be realistic about our efforts and about our, um, uh, and about our view of ourselves. Um, so I've done a few things, um, and one of, one of the most important things uh, that I feel I've done is help mentor and coach both entrepreneurs and students. Um, and I've committed myself to becoming a great mentor and a great coach. Uh, and I always thought that it would be easy to do this, but just like anything else in life, it takes a lot of practice. And so let's dig deeper into this. Um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal earlier this year which talked about what's wrong with the teenage mind. Um, and essentially it talks about the risks that teenagers take and why you know, we view teenagers as so, you know, as crazy as they are. Um, and the thing is, is that they're not necessarily crazy, okay? There's two parts of their brain. Um, it used to be that physiology, that, that physical maturity came at about the same time that mental maturity came along, okay? Um, that doesn't happen anymore, okay? When you imagine, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, okay, that, um, that physical maturity came around the age of puberty and people started training for their adult careers and people only lived to the age of 50 or 60. Okay? And right now we're extending our childhood. Okay? What we have is we have our kids getting um, going through puberty earlier and earlier, and that happens for a variety of reasons, some of which are kind of mysterious. But let's say you go through uh, puberty now at, say, 10 to 12, okay? We still have kids living at home at the age of 25, don't we? Uh, do I see any nods out there? Anybody at have, like, 25-year-olds living at home in the basement? I vowed to kick my kids out when they hit 18, no matter what. Um, so. So that maturity, um, that physiological maturity and the mental maturity just hasn't matched up. And in fact, that gulf has just widened. Okay? And so what we have is we have super smart kids and, and their IQ points are probably 10 to 20 points higher than they were 30 years ago. Okay? So they're, we're raising smart kids, but they don't have the experience. Okay? It's because they're living at home in our basements. Um, they haven't seen enough of the real world. So what do we need to do as mentors? We need to show them the real world. Let me give you an example. Uh, this is Megan Smulders. I met her a few years ago at Mount Royal University. Uh, she was a president of the entrepreneurship club there. Um, she paid for her education uh, through scholarships entirely. So she's a smart girl. Um, she had been working at a mortgage company ever since the age of 15. She started as a kind of office assistant, and she went there to, went from there to administering uh, full-on mortgages uh, over the 10 years that she was there. Um, and she graduated with a business degree, but she had no idea what to do. Um, and she asked me to, to not only help with her entrepreneurship club, but to give her some personal mentorship. Um, and, and so here's a girl graduating at the top of her class. Um, she was smart, outgoing, and ambitious, and yet lacked the experience to make a decision on a career choice. And can you blame her? Okay? We just don't give young people enough opportunity to learn about what to do with the rest of their lives. Um, so she came to me uh, one day and she said, what do I do about the 20 job offers that I got? Okay. So talented, people wanted her. Okay. Um, she couldn't decide which job to take. So I suggested that she take up to a year and try each one of these jobs on for maybe a week or two and decide after that. Okay. So she took that. It took a little bit of time for her to comprehend that because there's all this pressure to get out there and make money and pay your rent and make your way in the world. Um, and she decided to, to take on this project. Okay. So she, uh, she just mapped it out. Okay. She went and uh, came up with a schedule. She decided that she would find 10 jobs, work each of them for a week or two, and, uh, and use that as a platform to decide where her career should go. Um, 
And she worked for companies all across North America. In the end, she worked for 10 companies. Uh, she worked in software development, public relations, worked for e-commerce companies and a few nonprofits. And she discovered that her passion was uh, for technology and business. And it took her eight months to get there. Um, but she found the job that she truly loved. And she, get it, uh, she ended up getting national level coverage for her, for her efforts. And this part is really strange to me. Um, she appeared on the CTV National News. She appeared on the cover of the Toronto Star. Um, she had various magazine covers. Um, and the feedback was incredible. She blogged about her experience and she had 35 year olds coming up to her saying, Megan, I'm completely inspired by what you did. Okay? I should have followed your career path. Instead, when I graduated from university, I just took the job that was in front of me and I never discovered my true passions. So I'll tell you what, because of your story, I'm quitting my job, I'm going back to school, I'm gonna do what I love, right? So imagine being a 25 year old, being told by a 35 year old, right, that they've inspired them, okay? It's, it's amazing, okay? And it's amazing that at 35, we have people out in our society that haven't discovered what they love to do, okay? And this is the important piece of, you know, of our mentorship roles out in society, is that if you've discovered something that you love to do, I want you to take that energy and invest it in someone, invest it in a, in a young entrepreneur, invest it in a young student, and you'll see that pay off in our culture, and you'll see that pay off, um, pay off in bounds and leaps. So the way that I look at this, you know, in, in the epilogue is that, is that, you know, we see a lot of people get out there and spend a year traveling, you know, in Europe or in Asia after their studies to discover themselves, okay? Yet when Megan went out and talked to, she talked to sponsors to get, um, to get her project funded and she had business people, really smart, successful business people tell her to stop what she was doing and to stop fooling, this around, uh, you know, fooling around with this and to get a real job, get serious about her career, right? And I say that's 100% wrong, okay? Why wouldn't we ask our young people to take eight months and discover what they love to do? To me, I would support this all day long, right? Um, and, I think that, and I think that there's a prime lesson in here yeah, as mentors, is that, you know, is that there's a little bit of Chinese philosophy out there. Um, Oscar Wilde, actually, I think, phrased it the best. He said, nothing that is worth knowing can be taught. So as mentors and coaches, what we need to remember is that we can sit and we can talk to our protégés all day long, okay? We cannot expect them to just learn from our wisdom. We must push them out, guide them, okay? Ask them to learn, ask them to go out and create those experiences for themselves and, um, and report back, okay? And we must continually help them find their path, okay? So our job isn't to download our brains to them, okay? It's to actually push them in the right direction. Um, and following along that path, it's, I, I ask all the young people and all the young entrepreneurs that I, that I mentor to just ignore the old folks. And I'll include myself in the old folks um, category. Um, and there's a reason why. Um, I always, um, I always stick these really goofy pictures in my presentations, and uh, here's, here's one of them. This is uh, King Henry VIII, and you notice that on the, um, on the left-hand side, that's King Henry's suit of armor when he was in his 20s, and uh, you know, what a strapping young man he was back then, right? 32-inch waist, 39-inch chest, muscular, supremely fit, you know, this, uh, this talented fighter. Um, and by the time he hit his 40s, um, you'll notice that that thing was uh, uh, noticeably larger. Uh, by the way, the guy was six foot tall, okay? uh, had a 52-inch waist uh, by the time he was in his 40s. 
Um, he was crippled with gout, and uh, you can imagine that he was in no condition to fight, but he still had these incredible suits of armor made for him so that he could ride along on his horse and supervise these uh, conquests. Um, what I find really amazing, this is at the Tower of London, by the way. If you ever get a chance to go there, it's, it's an amazing exhibit and to see this in person. But you don't quite see this um, in this angle of the picture. I'm going to show you a different angle here. Um, and um, there's, a, there's some giggling in the crowd. Um, there's, a, some, there's a bulge in there somewhere. Uh, so you'll notice that, uh, that this armor here um, has this um, amazing little kind of tennis ball or softball size thing right around the crotch area. Um, I don't know what that was for, um, but maybe it was to, um, to really emphasize uh, King Henry VIII's ego. He had various wives and of course he had to show his, you know, sexual prowess, I guess, through this. Um, but more than that, I think it was to really assuage his ego. And I, I think that as six old successful business people, we tend to brag a lot about what we do. So, um, so, so I think that as I've observed um, the mentorship process in myself over the years, I find that, uh, I find that bragging really just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and one of the main reasons why is because when I created my company, that was 10 years ago. And the conditions, uh, especially in my industry and in technology, 10 years ago versus today are completely different. Okay? So when I get up in front of a crowd and brag about what we did and expect young people to learn from it, it's kind of like saying, this is the way we did advertising back in the 50s. Okay. It just doesn't work that way anymore. Um, so, so now I've completely changed that. Okay. So when young people ask me what I've done, I don't go into a half hour story of what I've done because I, I don't think it serves anybody any purpose. What we want to make sure they understand is that, is that we understand a few things, but we don't understand how to reproduce success for them. Okay. It's up to them to do it. Okay. We want them to duplicate our success. You know, I'd love to write a book and give them the formula. It just, just ain't going to happen. Okay. Um, and I think another illustration of how it's not going to happen um, is, uh, is the money involved in here. Okay. Um, money itself uh, is sometimes evil. Okay. And it's, it's really centered around the expectations and what you do when you have piles of money. Um, because think of how money is managed or created. And those are the two categories. Okay? So we, if you have piles of money, you hire money managers. Okay? If you have no money, you're in the business of wealth creation. And so imagine a culture where what we had was big old buildings, guys in suits, guys and girls in suits going up and down those elevators, managing wealth. And in today's environment, they do it, you know, in, you know, not so well. Um, so wealth managers, what does it take to create wealth managers? Okay. And that's probably the personification of most of downtown Toronto. Okay. And when you look out west, you know, what's amazing about Alberta's culture is that I see us as a culture of wealth creators. Okay. We don't have generations and generations of money to manage. Okay. We actually expect to create our own wealth. And that creates a vastly different culture. Okay? So I encourage old rich people, every time I get a chance to talk to old rich people, is to encourage them not to pass on that money to younger generations, or not pass on large amounts of it. Because managing wealth itself creates um, a huge cultural shift. Okay? We should actually destroy that wealth. Okay, and we should actually find other things to do with it and expect our younger generation to create wealth. Um, and the other thing I do is, is we should give good advice. Um, and this sounds fairly obvious, but um, you wouldn't believe how bad the advice um, yeah, you give is most of the time, right? And for the first bunch of years, my advice was really, really, really horrible. And it probably still is pretty half horrible. Um, I, I'm still learning. 
Um, but let me explain the difference between good and bad advice. Um, I started off the talk uh, comparing Canadians against Americans, and there's a reason why this kind of thing happens. Okay? Canadians um, or Canadian flags on the back of backpacks, even Americans like to buy these things. Um, I, had a, um, I had a conversation with an uh, immigrant recently, a Chinese immigrant, and I asked her how she was liking her, her new job and her new country, and um, she said something quite funny to me. She said, you know what, when I first came here I thought Canadians are so nice, right? but I don't think that anymore. I go, oh really, have Canadians just not been nice to you recently? She goes, no, you know, they're, they're very polite, very nice, but, you know, somehow they just aren't very helpful or useful or they haven't been helpful for me. And I go, well, explain it a little bit further. Well, she said that as she was learning, as she was going through school, for, so for the first little while, for the first year or so, she was very, very encouraged by all the positive comments. Okay? So she would hand in an assignment and her teacher would say, wow, that's fantastic. Your English is progressing along great. Your school studies are fantastic. Your homework's great. Okay? Um, but because she was Chinese, she was really looking for that critical feedback. And she never ended up getting it. Okay? So now, as she's hitting the real world, now she's getting some criticism. Your English isn't good enough. Your skills aren't up to snuff. Okay? And she said, what was I doing in school? Okay. Were my teachers just there to give me a pat on the back and just to encourage me to do a good job? They weren't actually teaching me how to do a good job. They weren't actually teaching me better English. So I think we need to really distinguish between giving people encouragement and giving them some good critical feedback. And I equate this to one of my favorite shows out there, American Idol. Um, are you a Simon Cowell or are you a Paula Abdul or Randy Jackson? Okay. When you give feedback, you know, are you afraid of being not so nice to people out there? Okay. So Paula Abdul, somebody gets up there and does their thing, they explain their business or whatever, and you go, man, that's a wicked nice suit you're wearing. Right. You completely avoid what they're, what they're presenting on. Um, or do you be Simon Cowell and you say, look, um, I appreciate your efforts, but that was awful. And here's what you need to do to change it. Okay? And this is really, really important. <clears throat> I hear this from young people all the time. Okay? They're just not getting critical feedback. Okay? They're asking for a dragon's den type teardown of their business. Okay? They want you to be mean to them. And, you know, we have to remember, Dragon's Den is entertainment. They're mean just for fun, okay? And I'm not encouraging you to be mean. I don't think there's any purpose to being mean. But I think we need to be critical. We need to provide the feedback, the real feedback on, on their businesses, okay? We need to tell them what the real world is going to say about them and their businesses. Um, and we need to introduce them to people. Leverage your network and have a, an industry expert tell them what they think about their business. Um, so don't be Kevin O'Leary, don't be an ass, um, but don't be Paul Abdul. You know, make sure you get out there and give great advice. Um, and community. Community is ultra important. I, I think there's, you know, you know, it's been, I know it's been about uh, eight years since we sold uh, iStock Photo. Um, and when we sold iStock Photo, there was just no community. So we really created our company in a vacuum. Um, and after, um, after we sold, I, there was nothing to do. And people encouraged me to get involved in the community. And I ended up becoming um, somewhat of an organizer and a participant and advisor to a bunch of community groups. And you'll see these groups kind of pop out throughout Alberta. And they're doing fantastic. Okay. Um, and there's opportunities for every one of you as business people, as mentors, uh, to get out there and speak and to support these events, uh, even as attendees or advisors. 
Okay? Uh, because throwing your support behind the young people um, who, um, who organize these events, and by the way, it's a thankless job. Uh, it's, it's volunteers and it's, uh, it's people just wanting to, to, to seek a real connection with the community, with the business community, means quite a bit. Get out there and support these people. Um, and there's, and it's creating a lot of commerce too. In uh, in both Calgary and Edmonton, there's this thing called uh, co-work spaces. So you'll see these people out there um, just dedicating uh, entire floors of office space where they're renting out uh, desks at a reduced rate, so that entrepreneurs can just get together and just start working together. So it's it's not like working in your own in your basement. Okay. Um, so I strongly encourage you to do that. Um, and finally, I just want to leave you with a thought. I started talking about um, all the respected professions out there. Um, and I think we all respect that lawyers and engineers and doctors uh, go through quite a bit uh, to get to where, where, they're, uh, where they've gotten to. Um, it's, it's hard. You know, there's, um, I make fun of them all the time, but really, um, I'm just jealous that I'm not a lawyer or an accountant. Um, maybe I'm not jealous that I'm not an engineer. But, um, but regardless, um, Cameron Harold has this great talk. Uh, Cameron Harold is one of the key entrepreneurs be behind 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And he was always a failure at academics. He graduated high school with like a 61% average. He went on to become a super successful entrepreneur. And what he talks about is, you know, if we have schools to train engineers and doctors and lawyers, why don't we have schools to train entrepreneurs? These aren't the MBA schools that we're talking about. MBA schools today teach risk management. They don't teach entrepreneurship. Okay? So um, it's something to think about. He's got a great talk. Uh, please have a look at that. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for listening and, um, and taking the time to hear my story of uh, entrepreneurship. And I hope uh, over the next day or two, I get to hear yours. Thank you very much. <laughs>